welcome to a lecture on advanced geotechnical engineering course in module 7 uh, lecture 9 geotechnical physical modeling. So this is module 7 in lecture 9 on geotechnical physical modeling. So in the previous lecture we have introduced ourselves to different types of shaking systems and then different types of uh, containers which are required for uh, you know the uh, for the earthquake based experiments. So this is the typical uh, two dimensional uh, shaking system available at RPI in New York and wherein uh, you can see that the swing basket uh, package will come out of the uh, chamber along with uh, the earthquake actuator that means that the earthquake actuator fitted in a, a sole basket and uh, they use this uh, for uh, performing earthquake experiments and for the rest of the experiments they will use a different basket. So this particular uh, uh, slide shows the use of a uh, you know earthquake actuator mounted on the swing basket. You can see that this is the portion which is actually subjected to shaking in this direction and in this direction. So this is actually a typical two dimensional shaking systems. There are also some three dimensional shaking systems which are available in uh, Japan and uh, other countries wherein they can actually have shaking in x direction, y direction and z direction. So this is the you know view of a laminar container which we have seen earlier and wherein uh, the, uh, the dynamic uh, stiffness of the soil will be identical as that in the uh, you know uh, at the along the edges as well as within the soil. So the, in this way what will happen is that in the event of shaking the soil actually takes the form of the shape which is exerted by the uh, you know by the uh, body subjected to this motion. So here uh, for example uh, a pile subjected to uh, you know the earthquake shaking is being studied. So you can see that uh, you know different types of instrumentations are actually placed to monitor uh, during the earthquake. So this is a typical uh, laminar box uh, uh, at the Schofield Centrifuge Center wherein you can see that you have got uh, different types of uh, you know aluminum discs which are actually placed and uh, contained in uh, this direction as well as so for shaking in this direction and also the contained in this direction. So this is uh, you know set the distance is set depending upon the whatever the amplitude uh, is allowed. So this is a typical uh, model container in National University of Singapore uh, small uh, uh, one dimensional uh, shaking system and uh, wherein uh, we have the earthquake actuator. So after having seen uh, uh, you know the uh, you know different uh, avenues for uh, inducing uh, earthquake. Uh, and then scaling considerations by using the knowledge which we have gained let us try to look into this problem. So in a full scale structure a KSP 2A type sheet pile wall section having EI that is the flexural, flexural rigidity flexural rigidity EI is equal to 24 into 10 to the power of 4 kilo Newton meter square for returning a soil having a cohesion of 15 kilo Pascals and a friction angle of 32 degrees was used. A model vertical wall is constructed with the same soil and is subjected to constant angular velocity of 104 revolutions per minute in a beam centrifuge of radius 4.5 meter and is required to be tested for its dynamic behavior physically. The breadth of the model is 300 mm and the measured radius from the center of the shaft to the top surface of the model is 4.085 meters. Now we are required to find out what will be the thickness of the model wall uh, made of aluminum plate uh, that is take E is equal to 72 into 10 to the power of 6 kilo Newton per meter square that means that 72 giga Pascals and take unit weight of uh, bulk unit weight of the soil as 18.2 kilo Newton per meter cube and uh, what will be the magnitude of exerted dynamic force uh, during shaking. If the model is subjected to 10 cycles of 50 uh, cycles per second frequency with an amplitude of 1 mm. If the weight of the laminated container including the weight of the model wall and instrumentation transducers is 300 kg and also find duration of the shaking in the model and free property uh, in the and duration of the uh, shaking in the model and prototype and frequency in the prototype and also amplitude in prototype and error due to Coriolis effect. 
So here we have been asked a number of uh, things. Uh, so this is basically a sheet pile wall retaining uh, wall problem. So what we have is that uh, a model retaining wall is required to be selected. So for that based on the scaling considerations which we have reduced earlier. So E i in model uh, divided by E i in prototype is equal to 1 by n power of 4. So by where n is equal to the scale factor n or gravity level in order to get that uh, we know as we know the model weight model height and uh, model height then what we can do is that we can actually calculate uh, what is the radius up to the uh, you know uh, a point where the stresses in model and prototype are identical that is effective radius Re is equal to RT plus HM by 3 and after having obtained that by using NG is equal to RE omega square what you can do is that you can calculate what is the RPM uh, you know the RPM then you can calculate the N and by using that N value we can calculate what is the uh, you know thickness of the plate because here E of aluminium is not equivalent to E of uh, you know this uh, you know material which is actually used. So here uh, the E is not specified but uh, what we can do is that but that is the prototype EA value was given. So what we can do is that we can uh, take this uh, EA value and divide by n to power of 4 and you will be able to get uh, by knowing the E value of the model uh, uh, sheet pile wall you get the I value and based on that we can actually calculate uh, by using BT cube by 12 and by, by knowing the breadth of the model you can actually calculate what is the thickness of the aluminium uh, sheet which is actually required for modeling uh, you know EI is equal to 24 into 10 to the power of 4 kilo per meter square. After having obtained now determining the weight so by knowing the dimensions by knowing the weight we can actually calculate what is the uh, you know the uh, model weight and based on that one can calculate what is the uh, you know by knowing the acceleration by taking by picking up from the acceleration magnitude and so once we assume that this is subjected to a sinusoidal motion and uh, by multiplying with uh, the mass and then acceleration you will get the dynamic force. And uh, then uh, you know by taking uh, the 10 cycles of 50 hz frequency so in the model what is the duration and amplitude has to be you know n times that of uh, you know in the model so that you the details can be obtained and by picking from the velocity magnitude by calculating from the velocity magnitude and uh, by knowing uh, v is equal to r omega r is known to us that is r is equal to r e omega is uh, you know the rpm converted into radians per second we can actually calculate what is the model velocity. So 2 vv by v we can actually calculate the error due to uh, you know Coriolis effect. So this is the problem basically it is a combination of uh, you know the problem which is required uh, combined with uh, you know uh, even in static experiments also uh, you know in order to model the sheet pile wall we have to follow these uh, considerations. And the problem and uh, the uh, you know the problem for the figure for the problem one is actually shown here wherein uh, the uh, dimensions are uh, all are in millimeters and uh, this is a typical uh, laminar container and this is uh, 150 mm distance embedded depth is 100 mm and this height is 300 mm and breadth of the model is 300 mm and this length is uh, 350 mm. So uh, by knowing this uh, the bulk unit weight of the soil we can actually calculate what is the gamma value and uh, container and other accessories value is given. So entire mass is actually placed on the swing basket so we can calculate what is the uh, this uh, dynamic force comp component. So uh, uh, another important aspect which uh, you know uh, we uh, require to learn is that for any static experiment or dynamic experiments instrumentation is very vital. So the aim of uh, any centrifuge model test basically to get the data like displacements, water pressures or pore water pressures or accelerations and uh, you know uh, force changes and forces which are actually applied and the stresses in the soil. So in order to get that we have to learn about the instrumentation. So the aim of the model test in the centrifuge is to locate mechanisms and to get values or ratios for force or stress or displacement changes as well as to observe the response of pore and water pressures and degree of saturation degree of concentration. So uh, you know there are a number of types of uh, transducers which are actually available uh, for the centrifuge domain wherein uh, you know we have to use them to basically to get the displacements or loads and stresses and uh, you know the accelerations etc. So with an aim to uh, you know 
retrieve the information and uh, also uh, you know capture the exact uh, mechanism of failure before failure and at failure and also to get the you know values or ratios for force stress and or displacement changes and uh, you know the uh, you know instrumentation is vital so in the instrumentation what we have primarily first is that contact type uh, basically there are two types one is called uh, uh, you know linearly variable linearly variable differential transformers the other one is called potentiometers these are contact types and they are contact with the model there are also some non contact type uh, uh, you know displacement uh, measurement uh, transducers are there they are called as laser LODTs and they work on the principle of triangulation and uh, uh, the closer the, the, the smaller is the distance range then uh, you know the resolution will be very high. And there are also some force measurements like if you are applying a load on the pile or load on the retaining wall then you know if you wanted to measure what is the force which is actually applied then uh, uh, you know we need to know uh, measure through a load cell. So there are basically compression type load cells and tension compression type load cells wherein they can take both tension and compression and suppose if you are pulling a pile out of the uh, soil then you know you have to measure the uh, tensile force and if you are uh, trying to apply the axial load on the pile then you have to apply the compressive force on the pile and uh, so in between the load application uh, actuator and uh, the uh, object uh, this particular uh, load cell has to be fitted and to be connected to a data acquisition system for uh, retrieval of the data and uh, mostly and most widely used uh, transducers are pore water pressure transducers PPTs wherein uh, if you wanted to measure uh, uh, the so called uh, water pressures within the soil pore water pressures then uh, this is done through miniature type uh, pore water pressure transducers. And one important thing uh, we have to notice is that in centrifuge based physical, physical experiments because of uh, you know the uh, you know these uh, the transducers which are actually embedded in the soil have to be miniature in size that means that they have to be as small as possible so that they will not actually have influence on the and they will not actually act like a some reinforcement inclusion in the soil. In addition to that if you are actually trying to measure the stresses on the uh, soil then there are also now the pressure sensors are available and uh, there are also now uh, you know some uh, pressure sensors which are actually can be uh, available now they are called as uh, you know some foil type uh, disposable uh, pressure sensors. Suppose if you are actually keeping below the base of the footing then you can actually measure the, the distribution of the base pressures on the uh, soil at the onset of loading. And then for measuring strains we have the strain gauging technique and uh, with the advent of the optical uh, data equation systems image analysis and very recently the particle image velocimetry which is uh, you know being widely used in uh, you know centrifuge based physical modeling. Then we also have the accelerometers. Uh, like there are two basic types one is called uh, piezoelectric accelerometers which are widely used and uh, the other ones are now very recently have come they are called MEMS based uh, you know accelerometers. So we will look into the details of the you know different uh, units uh, in a uh, in a brief way. So here in this particular slide what you see is a linearly variable differential transformer LVDT and uh, wherein you have uh, a core and a primary coil and a secondary coils. So one primary coil and two secondary coils are connected in series opposition. So whenever the core moves here and that actually registers as a change in voltage and that is actually measured as you know the voltage voltage and this is a typical photograph of a typical LVDT and which actually has got contact type you know there is a this is the casing and this is called a core and uh, to reduce the stresses and there will be you know small pads will be attached to this one so that the stresses on the soil will be reduced so that they will not pierce into the soil. So this is a contact type LVDT and uh, the, uh, the important requirement to calibrate is that uh, you know we, we need to calibrate uh, for a given uh, millimeter what is the you know the all the you know the transducers which are actually uh, you know. Uh, you know placed on the in the model required to be calibrated. So uh, the LVDTs are calibrated by subjecting to different uh, millimeters like 0, 5 mm, 10 mm, 15 mm and for each uh, displacement you measure what is the voltage 
and by plotting uh, you know the displacement induced versus the measured output you can actually get uh, uh, you know a linear line and uh, within uh, that uh, range what we get is that uh, linear distribution. So sometimes you actually have minus 25 to plus 25 mm and uh, minus 50 to plus 50 mm. Uh, so this uh, different depending upon the requirement of the travel the transducers can be selected and potentiometers are uh, you know the uh, which are nothing but attached to a spring which is uh, you know subjected to the movement of the core which induces a change in voltage and uh, so that is also used for some uh, you know non accurate measurements. And laser eludity uh, which is uh, non contact type basically and the resolution is uh, the function of distance between the transducer and measure measurement area and uh, the shorter the distance better the resolution and uh, the measurement principle is based on the triangulation and the measuring of the refraction of a laser beam. So what will happen is that uh, you have a trans uh, you know this laser transducer and which actually uh, throws a uh, you know a light on the subject uh, uh, or object. So what will happen is that the refraction is actually received in a uh, same transducer. So with that what will happen is that uh, the laser diode which is actually projects a visible spot uh, onto the target space and the light reflected from this spot is actually directed through an optical receiving system onto a position sensitive element. So with that what it does is that it measures the uh, distance for example this laser eludity is fixed to a moving uh, uh, you know object then there is a possibility that you will be able to get uh, uh, you know the profile of the system during the test. And the digital CMOS and CCD array is used to as a position sensitive measurement elements. So the laser eludities are you know depending upon the, uh, the resolution uh, they actually have the accuracies uh, which, are, which may be required for usage in the centrifuge model tests. So this is a typical uh, laser distance sensor non contact type and uh, so this is uh, what actually is being shown. A with through this actually the light is actually shown then this is a connector to the data acquisition system. Now after having seen the displacement uh, transducers then the miniature PPT transducer which is called uh, pore water pressure transducers. So this is a typical uh, uh, pore water pressure transducer you can see that the diameter is about 6.5 mm and length is about 12 mm. So one can see that uh, you know uh, it has actually has got a diaphragm. And uh, onto this diaphragm uh, there will be small uh, miniature strain gauges will be pasted in a full scale uh, uh, the full bridge of the Wheatstone full bridge. And uh, so here uh, the filter stone that is porous stone a ceramic stone has to be remain saturated always. And uh, so what happens is that uh, in order to measure the positive pore water pressure water has to enter into this uh, chamber uh, between this diaphragm and uh, you know the uh, porous stone. So through porous stone the water enters into it. So it measures the head of water or the height of pressure above its mid height. So this is actually taken as uh, so as the water enters into this it exerts pressure on this diaphragm and this uh, deflection of a deflection of a diaphragm results in a change in the strain and that is recorded as a change in voltage. So uh, the pressure is this is calibrated again as induced pressure with the change in voltage. So when we plot the induced pressure with output in volts we can actually get a line which is a straight line passing through horizon and with that what we can get is that you know pressure by volts that is the calibration factor for a particular transducers. So these pore water pressure transducers are available from 0.5 bar to up to 35 bar wherein they can actually measure that is about 3500 kilo Newton per meter square of pressure. Uh, so this is a typical uh, pore water pressure transducer is shown here and this is the you know, you know protection for the sleeve here and then there is uh, uh, a uh, cable which is actually running uh, for the uh, to the connector to the data acquisition system. So this is the casing of a stainless steel casing of a PPT which is actually shown here. And uh, these are the typical uh, load cells and uh, which are used for tension compression uh, these are after HPM and uh, these load cells are actually used for uh, uh, you know for measuring tension as well as uh, compression and uh, we also have uh, miniature uh, contact stress uh, transducers and uh, they are of the size of a button uh, basically when uh, the load is applied on the pressure sensitive area so the it measures in uh, the results in a change in voltage 
so this actually also lead to the development of a pressure versus you know pressure versus change in voltage so in order to measure so let us say later when you are actually trying to do a retaining wall problem we wanted to measure the pressure on the wall and all and this can act this concept can be used so then in sometimes when you are actually have doing the partially saturated soils we need to measure the suction pore water pressure so in order to measure the suction pore water pressure as the soil is not completely saturated so here what will happen is that in the working principle of the suction pore water pressure is that here uh, the diaphragm is actually filled with water and uh, and uh, the ceramic disc is will be placed in position so here the difference is that water is actually thrown into the uh, into the soil uh, basically in uh, when uh, it is being thrown into the soil or surrounding soil it is actually relieved of the uh, deflection so that actually results in uh, you know change in uh, pressure so water from the soil and water compartment depending upon the saturated and unsaturated soils uh, will be considered so uh, this this type of transducers can actually measure up to uh, minus 100 to minus 200 kilo pascals of uh, suction pressure and uh, these are the typical uh, strain gauges in strain gauges foil type strain gauges are shown and uh, the gauge length is actually shown here and uh, which is actually having uh, uh, you know the backing what is called as a very important when you are actually trying to do on the particular uh, say uh, you know uh, stiff material or non stiff material depending upon that you have to have a backing and then you know you have got the copper nichron uh, uh, connected to a lead cables and that any change in the length is actually given as the change in strain so that is actually calculated as uh, you know these uh, uh, you know uh, the strains in particularly for example in uh, uh, model sheet pile wall or any geogrid layer if you wanted to measure uh, you know then you have to have a suitable uh, strain gauges which should be pasted along with a suitable uh, backing material. So this is the typical uh, installation of a strain gauge on a pile and uh, for some convenience to avoid uh, some roughness one can actually also take the leads uh, through the if the pipe is actually hollow uh, can be taken through the uh, through the pile. So these are the typical piezoelectric uh, accelerometers. So piezoelectric accelerometers are the traditional uh, transducers used to measure the acceleration to in dynamic centrifuge experiments. So when they are subjected to vibration uh, a crystal within the instrument gets uh, squeezed which in turn releases a charge. So this charged output is converted into voltage using a charge amplifier. So these uh, instruments have a natural uh, inbuilt high pass filter meaning that they are ineffective at uh, measuring accelerations at low frequency so approximately below 5 hertz. So this piezoelectric accelerometers are the traditional transducers used to measure acceleration dynamic centrifuge experiments and basically when they are used when they are subjected to vibration a crystal within the instrument gets uh, squeezed within it, which in, in turn releases a charge. So this charge output is converted into a voltage using a charge amplifier. So this is also uh, calibrated by a system wherein it can induce minus 1g to plus 1g and within that we have got a linear uh, you know variation. So uh, generally uh, these uh, accelerometers have calibration factors of the order of say some 7 uh, g per volt to 8 g per volt. Then uh, as I said earlier uh, the MEMS based accelerometers that is micro electromechanical system accelerometers. So these are uh, you know uh, MEMS accelerometers are small electrical devices they are basically used for measuring acceleration by measuring the force a mass applies to a spring. So the MEMS based accelerometers uh, they are the small electrical devices and they are actually used to measure the acceleration by measuring a force a mass applies to a spring. So they also measure inertial acceleration as well as the dynamic acceleration. So they have been used widely for field monitoring and have been used for 1G testing. So more recently their use in dynamic centrifuge test has been investigated due to their small size and the small weight and significantly low cost compared to their piezoelectric counterparts. So these dynamic in the dynamic centrifuge test the piezoelectric uh, uh, these MEMS based accelerometers are uh, being used because of their small size and small weight and significantly low cost compared to uh, their piezoelectric counterparts. So this is a typical uh, you know MEMS based accelerometer which is actually shown 
the principle is actually explained in the next slide. So here what we see is the schematic representation of the operating principle of a MEMS accelerometer and uh, we can see that and this is the proof mass and uh, there is uh, one anchor point where the spring is attached and another anchor point one spring is attached and there are fixed plates and uh, the, uh, then there is another moving plate. So these plates are attached to uh, you know the, uh, they, are, they are the fixed plates and this uh, plate is actually uh, subjected to movement depending upon the application of the load. So the MEMS accelerometers are typically fabricated with a on single crystal silicon wafers using uh, micro machining to uh, etch the defined uh, patterns on a silicon substrate and uh, these uh, patterns take the form of a small proof mass uh, which is actually shown here and that are free from the substrate and surrounded by fixed plates. So these are the fixed plates and the proof mass is connected to fixed frame by spring elements. So acceleration acting so this is the direction of acceleration acting on the proof mass uh, is to dissipate and plates connected to the proof mass move between the fixed plates and this actually enables to measure the uh, you know inertial as well as the dynamic acceleration. So the in this particular slide working principle of uh, MEMS based accelerometers is actually given. So here the MEMS based accelerometers actually have uh, you know the mobile plates and fixed plates and when the proof mass is actually connected to a fixed bomb by spring elements and acceleration acting on the proof mass causes it to displace and uh, the movable plots plates will be subjected to uh, you know vibration and the plates connected to the proof mass move between the fixed plates and that results in the you know uh, the uh, you know lead for the change in voltages and which we actually measure as uh, you know the accelerations. So the displacement causes a differential capacitance uh, that is measured by the integrated electronics and is output as uh, voltage that is proportional to acceleration acting on the proof mass. So uh, you know this is uh, you know the basic uh, uh, you know principle and uh, the applications earlier applications include motion activated user interfaces such as in smartphones and, uh, and uh, game consoles and protection systems such as free fall protection of hard drives in laptops and airbag deployment in vehicles. So uh, motion activated user interfaces such as uh, smartphones and game consoles and protection systems basically uh, for uh, in for of the hard drives in laptops and airbag deployments in vehicles. So these are fitted with uh, nowadays with uh, MEMS based accelerometers. Unlike piezoelectric accelerometers which are only to measure the changes in acceleration MEMS accelerometers can measure both constant and changing acceleration. So uh, these MEMS accelerometers uh, noted to have uh, you know lot of potential and uh, you know uh, the usage of this uh, can lead to measure either constant and changing accelerations in this at the onset of the seismic uh, perturbance particularly for dynamic uh, centrifuge experiments. So after having seen uh, different sets of uh, you know uh, the required uh, uh, you know the instrumentation. So uh, then you know we can actually look into uh, different uh, you know construction process which are actually there. So before that let us look into we question ourselves after having discussed uh, what is the requirement of physical model test. The you, you know we can answer this by considering the complex and non-linear uh, stress strain behavior of the soil and made of uh, interacting particles air water and different surfaces. So uh, this is one particular first reason uh, that you know you require physical model test and difficulty of numerical simulation of soil and soil structure systems at large strains and failure. So this is one thing where the numerical simulations uh, have uh, limitations and to validate and calibrate numerical methods like number of numerical methods which are actually available they are required to be validated and, and also have the once we calibrate these numerical methods just there is a possibility that we will be able to you know use them with confidence. And uh, then after having seen physical model tests we said that physical model tests can be that 1 is to 1 and 1 is to uh, n and uh, small scale then we also have said that uh, the centrifuge model tests are definitely superior uh, to the uh, you know the small scale model tests uh, performed at uh, uh, 1g. So definitely why centrifuge model test in the sense that since small scale model models are cost effective and the cost of centrifuge basic model tests are uh, is very small compared to the cost of construction. 
So if you are able to do this uh, in a uh, uh, before and then uh, construct. So in the, the, that this is the reason why the many uh, countries actually adopt ATM that is called uh, analyze test and uh, uh, and uh, construct ATC policy analyze test and construct policy. So the small scale models are cost effective and soil properties are highly stress dependent. So because of that you know the centrifuge model is the one of the obvious reason and centrifuge produces equal confining stresses in model and prototype therefore same soil properties. So we also have said that you know because of the simulation of the stresses sigma v and sigma h and because of that there is same soil properties are there and so that is one advantage. And then reasonable assumption that strains and deformations are also equal in model and prototype. And we also have seen that from the seepage and consolidation point of view the time required for completion of the particular event or this thing is 1 by n square times smaller. So that means that you know they can also give you know rapid results particularly when we are actually having some contaminant migration or pollutant migration studies where they actually take years together but you know the centrifuge model test studies will help will be possible for you to do it in a short time. Now let us look into this particular example of you know effect of pile installation. We actually have got different types of pile foundations like what we have is that precast driven piles and bold cast in situ piles. Then what we do in the you know in the in the installing these piles in the field is that a precast driven pile is actually driven into the ground by driving the piles into the soil. Now once we look into that uh, that is the construction process wherein a precast driven pile uh, is uh, the, the length of the embedment or the cut off of a pile is actually selected uh, based on the, the soil strata which actually has been obtained from the soil investigation. And uh, if you are actually going for a bored cast in situ pile so what has been done is that the, uh, with by augering uh, technique the hole is actually drilled. And, uh, and then uh, the reinforcement case is actually placed and uh, by using uh, if it is uh, underwater the, by using the Termi method uh, the concreting is done. So that is uh, so if you look into this uh, when we have got uh, pile installation through precast uh, pile the surrounding soil is actually subjected to additional confinement or compression and that results in a different uh, behavior uh, and the surrounding soil is preloaded and then you know it actually has a better k value but in case of bored cast in situ pile because of the removal of the soil from the surrounding soil there is a possibility of release of the or relief of the stresses which actually takes place. So because of that the k value or coefficient of earth pressure will be less in case of bored cast in situ piles. So if you are actually having you know a typical pile installed let us say through a driving into the soil then if you are actually having a a case where in the field if you are actually measuring a, a pile which is actually driven into the soil and measure the applied load versus settlement by using say pile load test. So in that case we may get the profile what we get like this. So virtually if you are actually installing the pile at normal gravity if you are installing the pile at normal gravity and you know test the pile at n gravities then you may get actually something like a applied load settlement behavior will be like this and which is drastically different from the one in the field. But if you are actually having a system where you have got a soil body and into which the pile is actually driven into the soil body by using a certain type of a robotic actuator and once the pile is actually driven and if you actually test the pile then you know the applied load settlement behavior was found to be very close to that in the full scale. So the reasons actually need to be understood between the soil stresses which are actually going to happen when the pile is actually installed at 1G and when it is actually taken to NG what will happen particularly in the form of a stress paths we can actually explain what is the you know the effect of pile installation and why you know pile installation should be performed in flight and that question can be answered by you know applying our you know knowledge of soil mechanics with the stress parts. So now let us say that if you have got a model pile installed at 1G. 
so when you actually have a model pile installed at 1G so you actually have sigma that is the stress and uh, uh, you, the sigma means sigma H or the uh, you know uh, if you take an element very close to the pile then sigma V is the vertical stress and sigma H is the horizontal stress. So because of the low stresses the stresses are low there is a sigma V and then there is a sigma H which is actually low stress which is actually acting on the pile surface. By driving pile at 1G momentarily the horizontal stresses are more than uh, vertical stresses and thereafter by uh, you know subjecting to high gravity in centrifuge the vertical stresses are more than horizontal stresses. But when you take this into uh, the centrifuge uh, then what will happen is that the vertical stresses increases and uh, pile is actually driven at 1G. So the stress will remain same and it actually has picked up the raise to the value whatever the sigma V raises and uh, corresponding to that it actually mobilizes. So installation at 1G in uh, dense sand because have the low stress levels in normal gravity and lead to the greater dilation and uh, higher uh, K value uh, and uh, so uh, this actually lead to you know basically the soil surrounding the pile actually experiences the greater dilation which is actually different from what actually happens in uh, you know in real practice. When uh, let us say that we have got a model pile installed at NG that means that uh, uh, you have uh, uh, soil mass which is uh, initial at 1G and when we take into the centrifuge the uh, you know the soil is sigma V that is vertical stress and the sigma H the, the, the stresses have been uh, magnified uh, because of the NG environment. And now when you are actually driving the pile then what will happen is that uh, uh, sigma H will be more than sigma V and then this results in because this is because of the, the increase in the uh, increase in the uh, you know the uh, horizontal confinement because of the driver driving of the pile during flight. So installation at NG increases the horizontal stress and higher K value. So here and this particular process was found to be very close to uh, you know if you are able to test the pile which is driven in the uh, normal gravity uh, 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 test the pile driven at NG gravities then there is a possibility that the load settlement behavior will be close to that observed in the uh, in the field. So from the stress path uh, diagrams we can actually plot so here on the x axis uh, the S which is sigma V dash plus sigma H dash by 2 is plotted and T which is nothing but sigma V dash minus sigma H dash by 2 is plotted. So and uh, here it actually shown and this is the K0 compression line and uh, effective stress paths followed by elements close to the pile for installation at 1G wherein that it follows that A, B, C and D. So the it follows this path like A, B, C, D this is actually pile installed at 1G which is actually uh, you know uh, the different from uh, the one actually happens in the field. In case if you are actually having a, a pile installation at NG it actually goes like follows this uh, compression light AP and then uh, you know PQ uh, and then QR okay. So this APQR is the you know stress path which actually uh, taken or uh, obtained for a pile installed at NG. So let us uh, explain this the horizontal stress uh, may possibly increase even above the vertical stress so that it falls below the 0 uh, BC at 1G and PQ at NQ that is that this horizontal stress increases because of the pile drive. So it uh, falls below 0 and uh, BC in case of 1G installation and then uh, PQ uh, in case of NG installation. If the above uh, you know the variation occurs at low stress level then subsequent consolidation CD will seek to re-establish and stresses uh, develop close to K0 line. So if the pore water pressure uh, equilibrium is required after pile installation at higher stress levels that is QR at NG then the horizontal stress may perhaps not change significantly and the soil will be left with in situ radial stress before uh, uh, loading of the pile takes place. So here if the uh, above variation occurs at low stress levels the sub subsequent consolidation CD will seek to re-establish and uh, you know uh, the stresses may develop close to K0 line that is uh, you know the uh, stresses may develop close to the K0 line that is actually this uh, is actually being shown here. 
if the pore water pressure equilibrium is required after pile installation at higher stress level QR at NG then horizontal stress stresses may perhaps not change significantly and the soil will be left in the in-situ radial stress before loading of the pile takes place. So uh, that means that uh, the here there might not be much uh, change and uh, you know and then you know the loading of the pile takes place in this the direction. So here once you look into this uh, you know the if you are actually adopting uh, you know uh, this A B C D stress path and A P Q R uh, you know the process if you look into this is actually distinctly different from uh, at pile installed at 1G and pile installed at NG they are different. So because of that and uh, this particular stress path is actually also analogous to the one is actually happens in the field. So in a way what actually understands is that in order to get the true results and the it is actually required now pile installation actually has to happen at NG and then subsequently load testing has to happen in order to have the results which are actually as close as to that in the field. So the now let us after having looked into a particular problem wherein we have seen uh, you know the typical uh, problem wherein you have got uh, installation of pile and then uh, we said that uh, installation of pile at NG and subsequent testing at NG is beneficial. Now let us also look uh, we have the you know problem of uh, construction process where it involves excavation in front of the wall. Suppose consider here you have a retaining wall and this is the soil which is actually backfilled. Nowadays uh, you know uh, large amounts of works are actually happening and wherein uh, you know if you are having uh, a particular foundation and uh, subjected to certain load what is the influence of excavation on the uh, you know the building foundations that can be investigated and uh, you know uh, can lead to very interesting results. So if you assume that uh, this excavation actually takes place in stages like stage 1, stage 2, stage 3, stage 4, stage 5, stage 6 excavations and this is the you can say that uh, you know the dredge level or the bed level which is actually anticipated. So nowadays uh, with the increase in uh, uh, you know uh, urban structures particularly in urban areas these, uh, these are actually becoming quite common and uh, so it uh, many times uh, many situations which are sometimes very difficult to model numerically. So these are actually tackled uh, very well by using the centrifuge based physical experiments. So uh, in this particular uh, sequence in the field sequence what will happen is that excavation actually happens in stages and so that the soil support is actually removed to the wall and the wall is actually subjected to uh, uh, you know ultimately subsequently the wall becomes unsupported. So this can be modeled uh, by using number of techniques uh, many people or many investigators actually have used uh, different types of earthquake uh, different types of uh, excavation simulators uh, like uh, uh, some of the simulators they include is that uh, we have uh, a blade which actually gets punched into the soil and then the, bale, uh, the blade actually drives or takes away the soil mass uh, and then drops into the certain area. So uh, that is one process and uh, now uh, there is also another uh, method which is actually called is that uh, they replace this area. Uh, so the wall is actually placed and then they replace this area uh, with a heavy fluid like zinc chloride and uh, you know the zinc chloride concentration is selected such a way that uh, you know you actually have identical uh, 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 you know stresses uh, in uh, both sides of the wall so that the K0 conditions can be simulated. Uh, but here uh, uh, this uh, zinc chloride being uh, you know the uh, uh, being actually having a, a fluid with a K, uh, the K0 is equal to 1 and particularly where horizontal stresses and vertical stresses will be equal and that leads to you know uh, when you actually take uh, a normal element soil element here the sigma V and the sigma H the sigma H actually less than sigma V and this actually leads to you know uh, you know uh, sigma h and sigma v they are not equal but in case if you are actually simulating excavation by using uh, uh, you know the heavy fluid then you know the sigma h is equal to sigma v that actually can lead to some uh, you know difference. So uh, to, to address this many investigators actually have used and the, to as an alternative to this actually um, uh, there is also some plate support system will be put and then you know once uh, you know reaching up certain gravity the plate support can move away and that also can lead to you know differential movement. So this is uh, you know uh, the excavation in front of the in excavation in front of the wall by using heavy fluid in bag drained in stages. So here also uh, what will actually happen is that uh, there will be a pore water pressure transducer and uh, you connect it to a wall and with a solenoid wall 
So once uh, we wanted to decide to this so many centimeters of fluid to be drained the solenoid valve will be on remotely and uh, drained into some other uh, compartment then uh, uh, so it actually one by switching on and off we will be able to construct uh, uh, you know the excavation. So this let us explain in terms of uh, the stress pass again uh, wherein uh, we have got uh, again S which is uh, uh, you know sigma V plus sigma H by 2 and uh, T which is sigma V minus sigma H by 2. So here so excavation stages is APQRS excavation by removal of the fluid pressure is that ABCDEFG. So here excavation in stages if you are actually doing then uh, which is actually close to the prototype what you can say is that A P and uh, Q A P Q so these are actually you know they meet at a point uh, here at a certain point here A P Q and uh, uh, Q R and R S so that is the you know the stress path which actually takes in the field but if you are actually removing uh, the fluid then it actually takes like A B and then C D and uh, E F and F G that is uh, this direction F G okay. So uh, you know if you look into this uh, because of the stress dissimilarity this actually leads to the difference between uh, the excavation through fluid as well as uh, excavation stages the stress paths are actually different one need to note down that uh, the excavation stages in APQRS what is actually uh, if you have done through a proper uh, uh, excavation simulator and that simulates uh, you know a system uh, which is close to that in the field. But if you are simulating excavation by removal of the heavy fluid uh, then you know uh, the stress path is distinctly different that we have to make a note uh, in this particular slide. So uh, let us uh, dissect this excavation stages APQRS excavation by removal of fluid pressure A B C D E F G. So AP which is actually consolidation and PQ is war consolidation that is the uh, removal of the uh, load and QR installation of wall and RS is the excavation. So if you look into this AP is uh, consolidation that is along the compression line and then we have seen that PQ war consolidation so PQ is war consolidation release and QR is what we said is that installation that is the driving of the wall and RS is the excavation that is the RS is the excavation. So if you are actually pre installing the wall then they actually meet at same point okay and so this is a stress path which is you know obtained by using excavation stages and excavation by removal of the fluid pressure so AP the consolidation at 1G and BC or consolidation at 1G and CD is the installation of wall at 1G that means that here CD the wall is actually driven into the soil mass at 1G say in a clay when it is driven at 1G so at low stress levels kindly note here. Then DE is the excavation replacement of soil with heavy fluid that is DE is nothing but excavation. Uh, uh, you know and replacement with the heavy fluid and then subsequently where you have got uh, EF the centrifuge acceleration changes from 1G to NG that is centrifuge acceleration changes from 1G to NG so there is an increase in the stress okay then FG is the excavation the draining of the fluid. So here the uh, stress paths are actually distinctly different and uh, the excavation stages if you are actually properly doing through a proper excavation simulator then we get very close to the what actually happens in the field is APQRS in the excavation by the removal of the fluid pressure that is actually ABCDEFG this is actually is obtained by uh, you know in the uh, field uh, uh, in the uh, uh, in the model by draining the fluid pressure. So uh, for the excavation in front of the wall uh, basically for a pre installed wall once again uh, this actually poses uh, robotic uh, challenges and the problem is uh, simult uh, you know the simultaneous removal of soil like horizontal stresses and vertical stresses and desirability to do this in stages leaving real soil below each excavation level that is actually is the requirement 
and uh, the ratio of the horizontal and vertical effective stresses before excavation will depend upon the soil type and uh, the consolidation history of the soil. And basically in sandy soil it may it might be as low as 0.3 in a stiff clay it can be as high as 3 that horizontal uh, stress. So practically the easiest way to applying varying load or a determining surface is to use the fluid pressure. So uh, this is uh, you know particularly the uh, you know uh, uh, the application which was actually used for uh, applying the pressures initially and then withdrawing the pressures by draining the fluid. So uh, the unit weight of the soil is actually greater than the unit weight of water. So this st strategy is to use a heavy fluid such a way that aqueous solution of zinc chloride uh, can be used. So in a fluid uh, if the horizontal and vertical stresses are of course always same in any level. So an assumption might be made is more important to maintain the correct horizontal stresses on the pre-installed wall than to maintain the correct vertical stresses on the ground remaining in front of the wall. Uh, so this uh, problem has actually has been described because of the Pascal's law the stresses in horizontal and vertical direction are same. So this can be addressed by using a combination of heavy fluid with air pressure. This can be addressed by using a combination of heavy fluid with a, a air pressure to supplement differential vertical stress at the base eventually excavated soil in order to able to provide the separate control of horizontal vertical stresses. So what actually uh, you know people have done particularly McNamara at all they have done is that uh, they, they, they have used the you know the heavy fluid but at the bottom uh, you know there is actually uh, you know um, uh, they have actually added uh, uh, you know the so called air pressures. Very recently uh, you know the work actually has been done at IIT Bombay is that combination of zinc chloride and uh, you know the water draining has actually been adopted and this is actually also found to produce the identical stresses as that in the uh, you know vertical stresses are actually simulated to as the identical that in the uh, model. Uh, that means that here uh, what actually has been explained is that by using a combination of uh, uh, heavy fluid and uh, you know uh, uh, water by draining heavy fluid and water simultaneously. So the weight of heavy fluid and weight of water such that you actually simulate sigma v like in the field and sigma h like in the field. Say for example for a normally equal solid soil when sigma h is equal to 0.5 times sigma v and thus those conditions can be simulated by usually by using this combination then there is no requirement of uh, giving air pressure at the base of the container. So uh, one uh, example which can be taken uh, is that uh, you know uh, suppose if you are actually having a particular slope and if you are having a pore water pressure transducers at uh, 5 locations and if you measure the pore water pressure then you will get the uh, reading like time versus pore water pressure like here this test was actually carried out at uh, 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 this data this figure which is actually shown is a test was carried out at 30 gravities. So you can see that they uh, you know a 24 centimeters of model. Uh, you know 25 centimeters of model actually has got this much height of water okay and these are the pore water pressure transducers within the slope and this is at the toe you can see that the pore water pressure is low here. So this particular example problem uh, basically consists of steady state CPS problem conditions were simulated for a slope having 12 meter height at 50 gravities and figure below shows us the uh, shows the you know phreatic surface are given and uh, these are actually obtained from the centrifuge model test and the slope portion as well as the base layer was moist compacted void ratio of 0.38 and the coefficient of perimeter of the soil is uh, 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 6 meter per second and what we need to do is that CPS velocity at the end of the 6th day and 12th day between points BC and BC that will be shown and pore water pressures and discharge per unit length of the slope at C and C and time of seepage. So average particle size is given as 0.22 mm and kinematic viscosity of the water is given as 1 centi stroke that is 1 into 10 to the power of minus 6 meter square per second. So this is the typical uh, problem statement and uh, the solution can be addressed uh, by using this particular uh, formula. So if you want the velocity now we can actually uh, between uh, B and C and B and C that means that this is the periodic line for 6th day this is the periodic line for 12th day. So water actually has prognosis from this direction. So by using this V is equal to K by gamma W K is the permeability of the soil that is 1.6 into 10 to the power of minus 6 meter per meter cube second uh, 1.6 into 10 to the power of minus 6 meter per second 
gamma w that is 9.81 kilonewton per meter cube delta p that is uh, uh, you know this uh, difference the pressure difference uh, that is 6.25 is the horizontal coordinate 13.21 and 10.34 so uh, this is about 3 meter pressure difference or a horizontal distance of 6 meters so delta p by l you get the velocity that is the discharge velocity now by knowing the porosity void ratio n is equal to e by 1 plus 1 e we can actually calculate what is the seepage velocity. So seepage velocity uh, at the sixth day and seepage velocity at the uh, you know uh, time of uh, uh, you know uh, you know twelfth day can be found out. And similarly, uh, you know by knowing the velocity, you can also estimate what is the Reynolds number. So by knowing the uh, velocity, uh, you know by by knowing the particle size, effective particle size, and uh, taking the uh, kinematic viscosity we can get Reynolds number and then we can check whether the Reynolds number is less than 1 for a allowable limit. So what we have seen is that this particular problem statement and, uh, and the, 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 these are the periodic surface which are actually measured through experiment. So from the measured data how we can actually calculate uh, you know basically the discharge velocities, seepage velocities and pore water pressures at different points during the course of experiment. Uh, during the course of the seepage can be established. So this is a typical example wherein uh, we can actually use uh, the data and calculate whatever we have actually done through uh, the experiments and uh, they went through the discussions and lectures we can actually use and uh, you know solve this problem. So in this particular uh, lecture we try to understand about uh, you know connected through different uh, shaking systems as well as through the containers and then we try to understand two typical construction process one is the effect of pile installation whether installation of pile in NG is important or 1G is important and what is the consequences of that and also one construction process which we have discussed is that excavation in front of the wall.